Hello, true duelists. It's YGO Strats, Yu-Gi-Oh! Single Card History, where I'm going to be talking about some of the cards that have impacted Yu-Gi-Oh! throughout the years, and some of the other ones that didn't. Today's card, one of the most annoying heralds that's not a ritual, Herald of the Arclight. Herald of the Arclight was first released in New Challengers in 2014 as a super rare, with notable reprints to date including an ultra rare print in Battles of Legend Heroes Revenge in 2019, and a rare printing in 2020's Maximum Gold. As of this video, it's spent no time on the ban list. A level 4 light attribute fairy type synchro monster, 600 attack and 1000 defense, the materials to summon it are any tuner and any one or more non-tuners, and its effect reads. Any monster sent from the hand or main deck to the graveyard is banished instead. When a spell, trap card, or monster effect is activated, quick effect, you can tribute this card, negate the activation, and if you do, destroy that card. If this card is sent to the graveyard, you can add one ritual monster or one ritual spell from your deck to your hand. Arclight is an interesting bit of support for a deck, not just because it gave a synchro to a deck that already had tuners, but also because what the fuck am I looking at? And don't tell me it's just the lower half of Herald of Ultimateness, because that just begs the question of what the fuck is Herald of Ultimateness? And why are its legs so damn good when independent from its body? My god. We'll never know, and quite frankly, I'm terrified. What I am certain of though is that this very solid little synchro monster has been very much abusable from more than just being an extra negate on different end boards. On release, Herald of the Arclight quickly found home in a number of Yang Zing decks, a deck made of legally not dragons that all have quick effects to synchro summon on the opponent's turn, with the majority of Yang Zing monsters giving a bonus to the monsters that used them as synchro material. Some might give them more attack, some might make them immune to spell or trap cards, and notably for Arclight, BN could make it indestructible by battle. As such, a not uncommon play was when a Yang Zing was destroyed by battle, it could float into BN, and if you had a Chew in the grave, you could summon it out using Chuin's effect, which meant you had the material on board to quick sync into Arclight using those two monsters, and it would be indestructible by battle. This gave Yang Zing access to a little macro cosmos on legs of sorts, especially when dealing with decks like Burning Abyss and Shadal, and on top of all that, it doubled as a bonus negate. Not a bad play at all. This wasn't what the card would really be known for, however, as just over two months after Arclight's debut, the Necroz archetype would come into the game, and it immediately became not just the deck to beat, but the most infamous home of this little synchro, or certainly for a time. Unlike Yang Zing, Necroz had zero intention of ever summoning this card out, instead it was used exclusively as material for ritual summons. Prior to Necroz, the only real notable ritual decks had been Demise OTK and some Gishki FTKs, and Necroz was here to retool the mechanic to make it not just playable, but damn good. Stepping around the common struggles of ritual summoning, the deck had access to Necroz Kaleidoscope, a ritual spell that could summon multiple ritual monsters at once, so long as you sent a monster from your hand or extra deck to the grave whose level would equal the combined levels of the ritual monsters you were summoning. So not only could Necroz swarm with greater ease, the more notable play for the deck was that you could summon out Necroz of Unicor by sending a copy of Arclight from the extra deck. This meant not only was it less resource intensive on the hand and field, but also that you could recover resources by searching as a reward for summoning what was one of your best monsters, notably by say, searching out Necroz of Brianac which itself could search out any other Necroz monster you might want, like the Valk for battle protection, or a Trishula for targeting protection, or to, you know, use Trishula. Necroz was one of the most consistent decks of its time. Early on, it could use the Jinlock to make it so only the Necroz player could play by summoning a copy of Colossalus by banishing a Jin releaser of rituals from your graveyard in what was some of the least fun Yu-Gi-Oh to play, or in the post Jin being banned format, where it was just a very good control deck with an OTK window. Either way, whatever variant was being played, it was playing Herald of the Arclight for the entirety of the time it was meta, and it still plays it today where it's, you know, completely irrelevant. After Necroz, Herald would continue to see some sporadic play in various decks. One deck that played it a fair amount would be Mermail Atlanteans. After receiving the phenomenal piece of support that is Neptibus, the deck was already known for OTKs in its prime, and Neptibus gave the deck even easier access to OTK lines and the option to make a 
half-decent board when going first, which is more often than not where Arclight would come in for this deck. Deep Sea Diva could get out heavy infantry from the deck, which would let you get a bonus normal summon to say normal summon Neptibus, do full Neptibus lines to go for OTK or just set up your graveyard or search out Molen Glacia or whatever, and then you could sink off Deep Sea Diva and heavy infantry to make one extra little bonus negate on board, and much like it had been played in Yang Zing before it, the macro effect was pretty decent in 2016, especially if you were going up against PK Fire. From here, it pops up in some sporadic decks such as Fire King Cosmo. If the deck ever wanted to make it using, say, a Ghost Ogre and the spare tin can that had eaten a Veiler, or in the next evolution of Yang Zing builds, which incorporated Metal Folk cards to allow you to destroy your own Yang Zings on your own turn without waiting for the opponent or fear of missing the timing. The next spike in play, however, would come in True King Dinosaur decks, a balls to the wall combo deck known for its incredibly high ceiling for combos and general fragility when compared to the meta threat of its time. That was Zodiac. That didn't stop people from playing it or it from being insanely good when it popped off though, and through a combination of Dinosaur's easy access to powerful rank 4 plays to go into Dolkan Lagia, coupled with Melania's Sosaurus effect to give easy access to not just protection for Dinosaur plays, but also a free summon of their level 1 tuner from the deck, it was a damn good one. Using Jurak Aeolo, the level 1 tuner, the deck had access to a little card by the name of Denglong, first of the Yang Zing. This gave it even easier access to make level 9 plays such as Trishula, and its ability to manipulate its level meant that you could either overlay it for a copy of True King of All Calamities, or even better, use it as a synchro play which would allow it to float into another Yang Zing, and since Denglong could search out 9 pillars on summon, this meant you would end your board with a Yang Zing face up and a 9 pillars to tribute it to negate any spell trap or monster effect. Where this all ties into Arclight was that Denglong would float into Suwani, you would tribute Suwani to activate 9 pillars of the Yang Zing, and then much like Yang Zing did back in 2014, you would summon out Bian using Suwani's float, summon Chuan from the grave, and then quick sync into Heralds to give the deck yet another negate, of which it was not lacking already. It was a truly insane deck to witness, and it was even the one to win Worlds in 2017 just due to the sheer force it applied in duels when it got to go off. And if you thought that throwback to Yang Zing in 2013 was fun, just wait until I tell you that Necroz topped a little bit at the regional level in 2019. With the release of the Imp Cantations for more consistency, it gave the deck more cards to tribute for Valk to draw more, and more reasons to open up Kaleidoscope, send Herald of the Arclight to summon Unicorn. The next deck to play it would be another combo pile, this time moving from dinosaurs onto rocks. At Emancipator, the best deck to never compete during the COVID years, was a pile of tuners and non-tuners, consisting almost entirely of level 2s and level 4s. The ability to spam the board with power Powerful Synchro and Link monsters was abundant, and thanks to Doki Doki being a great level 2 that could summon even more rock monsters from the deck, it meant that you would have a level 2 and the level 2 tuners to go into a wide variety of plays. It wasn't uncommon for the deck to also include a Herald of the Arclight on top of the already insane boards it was building, including cards like Appaloosa, Borlode Savage Dragon, and Abyss Dweller, and just a general statement of no from the opponent. Synchro Eldritch was the other deck to play it in the same format, this one utilizing Eldritch's strong trap floating engine to disrupt plays with their in-theme grave and field disruption, which was yet another deck that could do the oh-so-common in 2020 play by making a copy of Halka Fibrax, linking Halka Fibrax into Link Cross, summoning out tokens, and just abusing synchro plays for days. Arclight was a very common card for decks in this engine because Marching Metal Marcher was level 3, the Link Cross tokens were level 1, and making an early Arclight could help ensure a against a Nibiru. And in the post-COVID formats where we were allowed to play again, Arclight was still hanging around. Showing up in another ritual deck this time, Drytron would pick up the card, especially with the release of Diviner of the Herald, a level 2 able to send Arclight to the grave to manipulate its level to 6, to not only get a free search for a powerhouse engine card like Ben 10, but also making it the right level to overlay with any other level 6 that the deck would summon to go into Beatrice, which could send an extra Drytron to keep extending your plays, or a copy of Ava, 
to fill your hands with more fairies so that your Herald of Ultimate lists could negate each and everything the opponent tried to do. Which brings us to the time in which I'm making this video. Most recently, decks like Sprite that opt to play things like a Melfi engine have begun to play it as another bit of disruption to an already strong end board. Sprites being able to spam themselves out so long as you have twos make Melfi an easy fit into the deck. And with Melfi's tuner to make an easy synchro level four play, Arclight was the best generic and easiest fit. That that's the most notable deck that's currently playing it, broadly speaking, although I will note that there are people who talk about playing it in branded decks due to the new spell card Duality, which can summon a light or dark monster from your hand or extra deck whose attribute is the opposite to a monster that you've tributed but has the same type and level, which is niche as hell, but some feel that this can make Arc Light playable in branded since Aluber meets the requirements for level, type, and attribute. I have never seen it played in a topping deck but people insist to me that it is real, and maybe it will be real if Branded ever gets hit, but at the power level the deck is currently at under the June 2023 ban list, I don't feel that this is a play that's really needed. But you can probably see the appeal. For as little as Arc Light is in level and stats, it's a damn strong one in regards to its effect. Its ability to cause monsters sent from the hand or deck to be banished is always a strong one, disrupting far too many deck lists, and serving as an extra bit of trouble on top of it being a strong and generic Omni Negate of sorts. Overall, Heralds of the Arclight has become a staple of most ritual decks and a fair number of combo decks as well. As I said, the macro light effect is one that's arguably only gotten better as time has gone on, and its utility as an Omni Negate has made it solid for end boards it's a part of, whether as one more disruption or even just to force a battle phase to keep you alive for another turn. Not to mention, as long as Nibir is a card, a deck that can make this card quickly will be one that's got a solid edge when going first. It's not the strongest card or the most abusable one, but that does not keep Herald of Arclight from being a damn good one. And so that's our look at Yu-Gi-Oh! single card history, Herald of the Arclight. Stay tuned for our next video and feel free to suggest some cards to review or what type of video you'd like to see. Don't forget to like, and as always, subscribe to YGO Strats to impress your smoking Italian wife and so you too can be a true duelist.